In this video, we're going to take a look at the net filtration pressure. And what the net filtration pressure is, is the driving force that makes filtration happen. So just to take a step back and uh, review filtration just for a moment, remember filtration is the movement of water and small solutes out of the blood and into the kidney. And so what filtration involves is the use of an actual physical filter, which is known as the filtration membrane. Remember that there is a porous uh, layer of Bowman's capsule called the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule that coats the glomerular capillary bed. I'm trying to add that into the picture right now. So there's a portion of Bowman's capsule, visceral layer of Bowman's capsule that coats, coats the glomerulus and uh, the glomerular capillaries are porous too. And so that creates a physical filter. And so what the net filtration pressure is, is just a pressure that's going to drive uh, water and solutes out of the blood and into Bowman's capsule. So when considering the net filtration pressure, uh, by the, using the word net, you can probably tell that uh, there's more than one pressure that goes into this. There's more than one pressure that we have to consider. And just taking a quick look at this chart, there are two pressures that are taken into consideration for the net filtration pressure. One is hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is like blood pressure or um, water pressure, hydro, right? That's the fluid pressure inside of a region. And then there's also osmotic pressure. And you probably already know about osmosis and osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure would be a force exerted by, say, like a concentrated solution that attracts water uh, from a more dilute solution into it to dilute it out. So um, these are the two pressures that are taken into consideration when you look at the net filtration pressure. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is filtration occurs uh, between the blood and the kidney, right? And so there are two locations that you have to consider each of these pressures. We have to consider what the hydrostatic and osmotic pressure is inside the glomerulus, and we also have to consider what those two pressures are inside of Bowman's capsule. So in other words, looking at my picture again, the net filtration pressure is determined by what is the hydrostatic pressure inside of the blood, what is the osmotic pressure inside of the blood, and then I would have those same two considerations of Bowman's capsule. What is the hydrostatic pressure of Bowman's capsule? What's the osmotic pressure in Bowman's capsule? And when you take all four of those factors into consideration, you get the net filtration pressure. So let's take a look at each of those four factors one by one. Okay, so let's start with the hydrostatic pressure, which inside of the glomerulus, the fluid that's inside of the glomerulus, because this is a capillary, that is blood. So the hydrostatic pressure inside of the glomerulus is literally just the blood pressure inside of the glomerulus. And when we consider the blood pressure inside of the glomerulus, uh, keep in mind, here is uh, the afferent arteriole bringing blood into that's our tangled capillary bed, the glomerulus. And then this is the vessel that's conveying blood out of the glomerulus, that's the efferent arteriole. And notice how the efferent arteriole has a wider diameter than the efferent arteriole. And because of that, that's gonna allow a lot of blood to flow into the glomerulus, but it's not gonna allow that blood to leave as easily. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a blood backup in the glomerulus and that's going to elevate the hydrostatic pressure. That's the main driving force of filtration, that we're letting a lot of blood in, that we're not letting as much blood leave. We're building up hydrostatic pressure inside of the glomerulus. So you can imagine if the blood can't escape and it's under high pressure, that water and any small substance that can fit through these openings will leave. Okay, and that's the hydrostatic pressure of the glomerulus. That's the primary driving force of filtration. So I'm going to put my chart back on the screen and just say that the hydrostatic pressure inside of the glomerulus, which is literally just this high blood pressure, that this is the main um, positive force, right? This is a big positive force driving filtration. So let's take a look at the hydrostatic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule. When you consider the hydrostatic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule, what we're doing is we're considering, you know, what is, what is the water pressure inside of Bowman's capsule? And we know that, we just said, 
you know, uh, water and solutes are leaving the glomerulus, that fluid that enters into Bowman's capsule is what we call the filtrate, right? Or we could call it the glomerular filtrate. I'm just going to depict it like blue, like a water line. Okay, so we have filtrate entering into Bowman's capsule, and that fluid is exerting a pressure, right? It's exerting a little bit of a pushback on the glomerulus. The thing is, this fluid uh, that is entering into the capsular space isn't just you know, stagnant, it's just, just staying there, what will happen is we know this fluid will continually go down the drain that's attached here, and that drain, of course, is the proximal convoluted tubule. And so the proximal convoluted tubule is continually accepting the filtrate. And so what happens is there's a dynamic equilibrium here where filtrate enters Bowman's capsule and then it's continually going down the drain. So the hydrostatic pressure inside of uh, Bowman's capsule is just this pressure that's exerted uh, against the glomerulus. It actually opposes filtration. It's kind of saying that filtration can uh, only occur until Bowman's capsule is full, which it's never really full because it continually uh, keeps getting taken away by the quote-unquote drain, the proximal convoluted tubule. But take this into consideration. Uh, what if there was an obstruction? And I'm going to make this urinary obstruction really close uh, to our picture. I'm going to make it right here in the proximal convoluted tubule. So let's say you know there's some type of urinary obstruction. So now my glomerular filtrate can't go down the drain, so to speak. Well, we know it's going to happen in this case. We know that that fluid is going to start to accumulate then in the capsular space of Bowman's capsule. And once we fill Bowman's capsule with fluid, that would completely oppose filtration. So in normal physiology, you know, this would not be you know, a, a large factor, but actually in pathophysiology, like with an obstruction, this could become such a big factor that it could stop filtration altogether. If this was a sink and the drain was plugged, I know if I kept running the water, the water's going to overflow over the top of the sink. In the case of the blood and the kidney, what will happen is once the capsular space is full, then filtration would just stop. And so considering the hydrostatic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule, what we're looking at is we're looking at, you know, a small negative pushback, right? This is a small negative force that opposes filtration and it just has to do with the water that's collecting inside of the capsular space. I can only push filtrate into the capsular space until it's full, which normal physiology, it's never going to be full because it keeps continually going down the drain of the proximal convoluted tubule. So let's take a look at osmotic pressure. With osmotic pressure, what we want to do is we want to look at the osmotic pressure inside of the glomerulus, and we can also look at the osmotic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule. The reason that people call it colloid osmotic pressure is because this osmotic pressure is created by a protein gradient. And when proteins are in um, suspension, that's known as a colloid. So this is all that's referring to. So let's take a look at the colloid osmotic pressure inside of the glomerulus first. And so I'm going to use a, a new picture here. So what I want you to consider is this. Are proteins filtered? So hopefully you're thinking proteins are not filtered, right? Proteins can be hundreds of amino acids big. They're big, right? So blood cells are not filtered. I'm going to indicate proteins with this black uh, circle. These are going to be proteins. Proteins don't get filtered. They're too big. Amino acids, that's another story. Amino acid is not a protein, right? Amino acids are just single, you know, uh, micro uh, nutrients. Amino acids could be filtered, but whole proteins like albumin and so on, no, it's just plain too big. It can't get out of the pores. And so because of that, um, what will happen is the glomerular filtrate will contain water and small solutes. Okay, but there's no protein in the glomerular filtrate. And hopefully you can see this is creating a two compartment scenario just like we talk about in AP1, right? Where we have a lot of proteins in the blood, no proteins in the glomerular filtrate, which is going to mean that as water and substances, small substances get filtered out, an osmotic gradient is being created where the blood is becoming very concentrated with these proteins. The glomerular filtrate is uh, dilute. And so just due to the laws of osmosis, we know that water will move 
from the area of high water concentration into the area of low water concentration. And when water moves, it's going to move from the glomerular filtrate back into the blood of the glomerulus. So you can see that the colloid osmotic pressure of the glomerulus opposes filtration. It's going to actually attract some water back just by the laws of osmosis. And so taking a look at this third factor, osmotic pressure inside of the glomerulus, uh, the colloid osmotic pressure inside of the glomerulus is actually a, a small negative force. And what it does is it attracts water from the filtrate back into the blood due to the protein gradient. So let's take a look at our uh, last factor, the uh, colloid osmotic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule. So taking a look at this picture again, we know that proteins don't get filtered. And because proteins don't get filtered, there is no osmotic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule, right? It would be, you know, zero. And so that's why on many of the equations in the textbook, they don't even take this into consideration. You know, uh, under normal physiology, this would equal zero. And so uh, that gets taken right out of the equation. But you can imagine in pathophysiology, you, you might have to bring this back into the equation if you had kidney damage, some type of physical damage, where proteins were uh, allowed to pass and accumulating out here, then you might have a colloid osmotic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule, and uh, that would be brought back into the equation. So in the end, with the net filtration pressure, what you're really looking at um, is you're looking at the hydrostatic pressure in the blood, in the kidney, what is the osmotic pressure in the blood and in the kidney. Usually there's no osmotic pressure in the kidney because proteins don't get filtered and so you take that factor out. And so taking a look at the picture in our book, we can see uh, what they're doing here is they're depicting the pressures with an arrow that the hydrostatic pressure inside of the glomerulus is that big driving force. That's the blood pressure that's just forcing water and solutes out the hydrostatic pressure of the capsular space of Bowman's capsule, that's a small negative force. You can see the arrow going in the opposite direction. That's a little pushback from the filtrate that's already accumulating there, but as long as that keeps going down the drain of the proximal convoluted tubule, then um, you know it's gonna be just a uh, small negative force. As far as the osmotic pressure inside of the glomerular capillaries, you can see that's a decent negative pressure. The fact that proteins don't get filtered will attract water from our filtrate back into the blood. That opposes filtration. And then they didn't even add the osmotic pressure of Bowen's capsule because it's zero. And so to get the net filtration pressure, uh, what you do is you look at the outward pressures, that's driving filtration, and I'd have to subtract away anything that's opposing filtration. Or literally, you can just assign like positive and negative values to these. So driving filtration, I'd say that's a positive 55. Uh, opposing filtration, this is a negative 30. That would leave me with a positive 25, right? And then uh, opposing filtration again, the hydrostatic pressure inside of Bowman's capsule is just a negative 15. We're at uh, 25, so if I have to take away 15, that leaves me 10. And you can see you don't even really need an equation to figure this out. You just need to say if it's driving filtration, that's positive. If it's opposing filtration, that's negative. So hopefully this helps make more sense out of the net filtration pressure.